Good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. I'm John Holdren. Uh, I direct the program on science, technology, and public policy in the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs, and it's my pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce uh, our speaker for this uh, 2005 Gustav Pollock Lectureship. Uh, I do want to mention that the Gustav Pollock Lectureship was founded in 1951 by Leo Silver as a memorial to the journalist Gustav Pollock, who wrote for The Nation and a variety of other publications in the early 20th century. Uh, I also want to mention before I introduce our speaker that uh, there have been a number of uh, student groups energetically involved in the organization and publicity of this event. Harvard College's Environmental Action Committee, uh, which is uh, an umbrella group for the Harvard College environmental organizations. Uh, the Kennedy School's Environment and Natural Resources PIC, that is the uh, Professional Interest Council in Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, and finally, the Harvard Environment Society, which is the umbrella group for all of the environmental uh, groups across all of Harvard schools, not just Harvard College, not just the Kennedy School, but all of them. Uh, it is a particular pleasure to be able to introduce uh, Peter Raven for this lecture this evening. It's a, sort of a commonplace to say that somebody one is introducing is one of the most distinguished this, that, or the other thing in the world. But in the case of Peter Raven, he really is one of the two or three most distinguished biologists in the world. Um, his resume is mind-boggling. I was tempted to bring in here all 57 pages of it and threaten to read it, but that would take too much of his time. But I do uh, I do want to mention uh, a few things. Uh, for his uh, extraordinary work in, in biology, in conservation, and the preservation of biodiversity, uh, his work as the director of the Missouri Botanical Garden for more than 30 years, uh, which is, by the way, a world-class center for botanical research and education and horticulture display, uh, Peter has received the most extraordinary array of awards of anybody I know. He holds the Crawford Prize, which is the 
equivalent in biology to the Nobel Prize. There is no Nobel in biology, as most of you know, but the Crawford Prize, which is also awarded by the Swedish government, is considered the closest equivalent in biology to a Nobel. He also uh, has been a MacArthur Foundation Prize Fellow, has received the International Prize for Biology from the Government of Japan, the Volvo Environment Prize, the Tyler Prize for Environment, the Sasakawa Environment Prize, and many more. Uh, he is the past president and now chairman of the board of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which is the largest association of scientists in the world. He is also, uh, incredibly enough, the chairman of the National Geographic Society's Committee for Research and Exploration. He's the chair of the Division of Earth and Life Studies of the National Research Council, which includes biology, chemistry, and geology. I had the pleasure of serving with him on President Clinton's Committee of Advisors on Science and Technology from 1994 to 2001. In 2001, he received the National Medal of Science, which is the highest uh, award for scientific accomplishment given by the United States government. Uh, he was also Home Secretary of the National Academy of Sciences for 12 years, and people who really know the Academy of Sciences know that that position is much more powerful than that of the President of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, <clears throat> Peter Raven uh, will be talking to us tonight uh, on the subject of biodiversity and sustainability, how to forge the link. Uh, I don't know anybody who is uh, more able to do so. So Peter, without taking more of your time, uh, welcome to the Kennedy School. Thanks, John. In the course of your remarks, I was reminded of a cartoon in The New Yorker from the 1940s that showed two monks passing one another in front of a monastery, and one is saying to the other, but I am holier than thou. <laughs> a little bit over the top, but thank you very much. What I want to do is make some remarks about biodiversity and linkages with sustainability, and then, of course, we'll have a considerable period for questions and answers later. The first thing I have to learn is <clears throat> where to push this to advance it. That's not the place. That's the place. All right. There were only two good choices on the top or to the right. It turned out to be the latter. Uh, biodiversity is known to every single human being on Earth as something extraordinarily beautiful and wonderful that fills our lives with pleasure. And we think of it as uh, such, we often don't think of it as the fundamental ingredient that supports our lives here on Earth and makes them possible. Before the invention of crop agriculture, before the development of crop agriculture in the Eastern Mediterranean about 10,500 years ago, which is just 425 generations, a very short space, either in the two million year history of human beings on Earth or of course in the 4.5 billion year history of the planet, the total human race consisted of about three to four million people scattered over all the continents of the world except Antarctica, North and South America, Eurasia, Africa, and Australia put together had about as many people as, as uh, Eastern Massachusetts. As you can imagine, and as you well know, when those people began to develop crops, they had food, they could steal it from one another, they could overpass unfavorable seasons, they could have wars over cultivated land, and the whole quality of life on Earth began to change very rapidly. The population grew to several hundred million people at the time of Christ, to about a half a billion people in early Renaissance times. And when Thomas Malthus was saying that our population was growing faster than our food supply in the 1790s uh, and didn't really see how the Industrial Revolution would get people out of that dilemma, the world population was about 800 million. About uh, a billion people early in the 19th century, two billion in 1930, two and a half billion in 1950 and on to the present, as I'll show you for a minute, in a minute. It's not only population, though, that occupies the Earth, as you can see by this nice example of suburban sprawl, probably from 
eastern Colorado. It's also the careless way in which we eat up the earth by ill-planned and affluent means of consumption, which really devour a lot of the productive capacity of the earth and a lot of the space for other organisms on earth. As a result of the combination between the use of, uh, between population numbers, affluence, levels of consumption, and technologies in an equation that, uh, that uh, John and Paul Ehrlich developed uh, many years ago, I equals PAT, which we'll come to in a minute. As a result of the combination of those forces, we have a world in which the environment is deteriorating very rapidly. As you can see on this slide, 50% uh, half of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. One in eight people is literally starving by UN recommended minimum caloric standards. And about one in two of those uh, people, uh, uh, I can't read my own slide. You read the third paragraph there and you'll know exactly what I mean. <laughs> Here's inappropriate technology. Uh, that's Los Angeles. You probably know David Letterman's line about Los Angeles. Autumn is my favorite season of the year in Los Angeles. It's when the birds change colors and fall out of the trees. <laughs> Here's the Ehrlich-Holdren equation. Population, which we often think of as living in a country like the United States is the only important factor. Uh, affluence or consumption and technology. It's important to remember that it's the product of those three together that cause impact on the Earth because uh, the impact, if you figure it out, of the 145 million people added to the population of the United States since the end of World War II who are living in about 40 times the standard of living in people in rural Brazil or rural Indonesia approximates the impact of the entire four plus billion population of the developed world. So that is why, and I'll get back to this briefly in a minute, that is why our own actions are so highly significant and why it's such a ruinously inaccurate allegation to assume that it's just basically people in developing countries who are causing the problem. From two and a half billion people in 1950, the population has zoomed upward to about 6.3 billion now and the World Bank, in its latest estimate, has projected that if we continue to attend to family planning uh, uh, all along the way, that the global population may stabilize at about 9 billion, 9.1 billion people near the middle of this century. While the global population has grown from 2.5 billion people in 1950 to 6 billion people at the end of the century, we have lost an estimated one-fifth of all the topsoil in the world, which of course is irreplaceable at anything like that rate. We've lost about 20% of all of the agricultural land in the world, so that we're now growing agricultural land on about 80% of the, uh, we're now growing our food on about 80% of the land that we cultivated in 1950 when there were well under half as many people as there are now. We've cut down about a third of the forests. We've added about 15% to the carbon dioxide, the main driving gas produced by humans for global warming. And we've depleted the uh, stratospheric ozone layer by about six to 8%. Uh, as a result of this, um, <clears throat> I can't read that either. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> Uh, we have a world that is very unbalanced. For example, the United States, with 4.5% of the world population, uh, controls about 25% of the world economy and has about 30% of the scientific output, whereas the 80-plus percent of the people in the world who live in developing countries uh, have about 15% of the world's money and about 10% of the scientific output. And this kind of imbalance is very deeply ingrained, as I'll review in a minute, and, and leads to many of the adverse environmental effects that we're talking about. 
Now, a very key question in all of this, and a question that is begged a bit by the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, the Brundtland Report, is whether all of the world's nations, even if we had a stable population, could attain the current standards of affluence of the industrialized countries using technologies that are widespread now. And if you've studied the report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, you really would find a picture presented something like that. It's sort of as if, if all the developing countries would pull up their socks and manage their affairs better, they could become industrialized and then we'd all be living about the same way. How true is that? Well, how many planets do we need? What percentage of the sustainable productivity of the world are we using on a continuing basis? Right now, with the inequities that I've just talked about, Mathis Wackernagel, who runs a very good uh, and explicit uh, think tank on this subject in Oakland, California, has calculated, along with his colleagues, that to support everyone at the current standard and population, it re would require about 1.2 copies of the planet Earth. We only have one. They calculate that we've gone from about 70% of the total productivity on Earth annually in about 1970 to about 120% today, which is clear mark of lack of sustainability. And how many would we need to support everyone at the standard of living of the developed nations at present? In other words, the answer to the question that was posed at the beginning. Well, we'd need three copies of the planet Earth if everybody on Earth was consuming at the same level that we are in the United States and using the same technologies that are widespread at the present time. For example, if everyone in China, the Chinese government and uh, certainly all the auto manufacturers assume that it'd be a great idea to everybody in China to buy cars, they're developing highways all over Tibet, uh, they're developing a railroad from Urumqi to Lhasa and so forth. If everybody in China had the same proportion of cars that we do in the United States, it would require the entire petroleum supply of the entire world to supply gasoline for them. So that's pretty clearly a technology that doesn't work. Now, how about if the population doubled? Remember that the population is expected to go up by another from 6.3 billion to 9.1 billion at best, if we're very attentive to population growth, then we'd need six of them. And if everybody went up to the same standard of living that we have now in industrialized countries, we'd need 12 of them. It's not very clear where we'd get those extra planets, but it seems like a good idea if we could. I remember when I was at Stanford in the 60s, we calculated, people were talking about space travel to take care of excess population. And at one point, we calculated that if we use the entire uh, gross product, economic product of the entire world, we could, uh, we could export 12 people a year to the nearest galaxy that might have a planet like, might have a, uh, something like the planet Earth. If we measure total net terrestrial photosynthetic productivity, which is the form of uh, photosynthesis, uh, the, which is the photosynthetic output that's most accessible to human beings, uh, a, a, an article published in the 1970s in Science in which John Holdren was one of the authors, Peter Vitusik was the senior author, calculated that we're using, diverting, or wasting about 45% of it at the present time. And if you remember that that's 45% of the total, that there are 10 million other kinds of organisms on Earth, and that uh, half the people in the world are living in absolute poverty, you can begin to understand the way in which these relationships don't quite work. Uh, that's a case of diverting productivity, a golf course in Los Angeles. Uh, on the other hand, it's been calculated more recently that we're consuming about 55% of the total supply of sustainable fresh water at the present time. And yet well over a quarter of the people on Earth don't have access to high quality fresh water. Now considering the question of biodiversity, the, the summary of what I'm going to say about biodiversity is that not only is its loss serious for a variety of reasons that I'll review briefly, but also by losing it that we're losing a substantial number of uh, 
items or, or species that could alone or in combination help us to develop a truly sustainable earth. As you know, we get all of our food directly or indirectly from plants for all practical purposes. Uh, the genetic diversity of the hundred or so crop plants that supply the great majority of our food exists all over the globe, and it's very difficult to manage and marshal it so that we can keep increasing the quality of that food, much less put other areas into cultivation or develop other crops from them. A great majority of the people on Earth get all their medicine from plants directly, and even from those, even for those of us who live in industrialized countries, uh, about a quarter of the drugs that we could get as prescriptions are either natural products or based on natural products originally from plants. And then we need to remind ourselves that we're only 52 years from the postulate of the double helical model of DNA. We're living in an age of molecular biology, but we're living in an age of molecular biology in which the first transfer of a gene from one unrelated kind of organism to another took place only uh, in 1973. The first deployment of drugs uh, that were genetically modified and a little later of crops that were genetically modified took place in the early 1990s. And it was only as the 90s ended and this century began that we began to be able to compare whole genomes and gene families from different organisms. By losing so many organisms on Earth, and I'll review the statistics for that in just a minute, we are basically committing the crime that Aldo Leopold warned us against. We're tinkering without saving the cogs and wheels. We're expecting to base a good deal of our future on our ability to use organisms productively, but we're wasting the organisms, and by doing so, wasting the ecosystem services that those organisms provide and the sheer beauty of those organisms that goes so far to enrich our lives. Now, how many species of eukaryotic organisms are there? First of all, I need to say that anyone who attempts to estimate the number of species of bacteria and archaea in the world, prokaryotic organisms, is nuts. And if you find somebody doing that, don't bother reading the article any further. Uh, because if you use DNA hybridization, a lack of hybridization of 30% of the genome as a measure of bacterial diversity, you can get a million species in one cubic meter of soil, and yet only about 4,000 of them have names, and nobody has the foggiest idea whether another cubic meter of soil would have the same ones or not. We're just beginning to. But eukaryotic organisms, microorganisms other than bacteria, fungi, animals, and plants, uh, have about 10 million species, as estimated by Bob May in a very careful review of the whole subject. That's a conservative estimate. And yet only about 1.6 million of those at best have been given a scientific name. And remember that of those, probably only 100,000 are known in any degree. Most of the rest are something like a tiny corpse in the bottom of a jar of alcohol in the back room of the Natural History Museum in London or the MCZ here. And even if you identified another one, that's all you'd find out. Somebody got one in Manaus 145 years ago, and they didn't know anything about it either. We can estimate extinction rates by looking at the extinction rate in the fossil record over the last 65 million years since the great extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous period. We can compare that. That's about 10 a year, about one per million per year. We can compare that with historical rates in the past few hundred years when people had the data to estimate extinction for well-known groups of organisms, which was getting into hundreds per year thousands per year at the present time, and uh, a great increase in that with habitat destruction around the world in the years to come. Uh, tens of thousands of species per year, certainly later in the 21st century, and uh, the possible extinction of as many as two-thirds of all the species on Earth by the year 2100 because of habitat destruction alone. But habitat destruction is by no means the only force that's driving species to extinction. We also have gathering species in the wild, bush meat, for example, in animals, or gathering medicinal plants in the wild, 
which is hounding many of them of great economic importance to extinction. We have the invasion of alien, in, uh, we have alien invasive species, which are, the, which are the cause of threat for about a third of the endangered species of plants in the United States. And we have global warming, which by any of the conventional models would eliminate alpine tundra and alpine habitats in the lower 48 states, for example, by the end of this century. Uh, we can get a very vivid idea of what global warming can do to species by looking at some of the ranges of endemic animals that have been charted in the tropical forests of northern Queensland and Australia. Uh, as you can see, with very small amounts of warming, the habitable area is greatly decreased, and with uh, 3.5 degrees, it's decreased to nothing. So if you look at all of those ranges together of 70-odd endemic animals in that forest, and you superimpose on that the predictable uh, global warming during this century, or the ranges of global warming, you can see that virtually none of them can, can last out this century of those very restricted animals. So how do we preserve biodiversity? By preserving parks and protected areas, a difficult thing in the face of some of the factors that I've talked about. By protecting biodiversity in disturbed habitats that are dominated by human beings. By fighting alien invasive species like the snakehead fish on the right, which is now naturalized in the Potomac River and has shown up in Lake Michigan and basically eats everything inside, or the water lettuce on the left. By taking species out of nature and preserving them in seed banks or similar facilities. But at a broader level, the only way in which we can preserve biodiversity is by forging a world that is sustainable and just. If half the people in the world are living in extreme poverty and uh, a quarter of them are living in conditions where they can't support the development of their minds and bodies, there's no real hope of preserving biodiversity throughout the world. Again, biodiversity not only provides many of the means by which we might achieve sustainability, but the lack of sustainability is what's driving it to extinction. We can educate people like these uh, women in the Western Ghats in India who are learning how to manage their own biodiversity, in this case drugs, for value-added products. We can alter in elegant ways that Dr. Holdren has uh, told us, informed us so well about our sources of energy. We can study and learn about organisms all over the earth and apply that knowledge to their preservation. And in a very high consumption society like the United States, we can take many steps to promote sustainability around the world on an individual basis. In fact, sustainability will not come to us top down. It has to come bottom up. And you are all familiar at one degree or another with steps that we can take. Environmental literacy in ourselves and in our groups and for university communities is a very important part of the mix. Uh, organizations like um, individual nations or international organizations cannot really save biodiversity, and they really will not achieve environmental sustainability without the, the forthright action of their citizens demanding that. I often get asked whether the President of the United States, and I mean any president, is really an environmentalist, and I say, uh, why would you expect him to be when American people put the environment 14th on a list of uh, things that they'd like to deal with, that they regard as important problems? Neither the President of the United States or anybody else can cause something to happen that they don't, that isn't supported politically. 20 million people, one out of 10 in the U.S., were out at the first Earth Day in 1970, and if you had one-tenth of the population in the United States out demonstrating at the present time, you could be very sure that President Bush would be a very certain environmentalist within a matter of days, uh, just as President Nixon, who was, of course, uh, a liberal Republican, really uh, was an environmentalist and signed most of our significant legislation. We also need to enlist corporations in the cause of sustainability 
but we especially need to empower one another and people around the world in an atmosphere of justice and equality because there's nobody in the world who doesn't want sustainability, clean water, clean air for themselves and their children. Uh, and many, and in any village anywhere in the world or any nation anywhere in the world, you can find that to be true. Well, those are the remarks that I had to make, and I now will be very happy to uh, entertain your questions and suggestions. Thank you, Peter. We have about half an hour for the Q&A. Uh, most of you already know how this works. There are four microphones, two down here on the ground floor, and two uh, up on the first level. If you uh, want to ask uh, Professor Raven a question, come to one of the microphones. We'll just uh, rotate around the room among them. Uh, when you are recognized, uh, please identify yourself uh, briefly and, uh, and then ask a question. A question is a sequence of words of moderate length ending with a question mark. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and we'll start over here, please. Uh, Dylan Voorhees, I'm a master uh, public policy student here at the Kennedy School. Um, my question is about individual consumption and I guess very simply, do you think that people in the developed world need to come to terms with a reduced standard of living in order to uh, achieve sustainability? I think people in the developed world, first of all, need to come to grips with absolute waste. We use about twice as much energy per capita in the United States as they do in Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, or Norway, and it's very, very difficult to demonstrate that we get anything for that. It's time that we thought about not wasting, which is much more palatable than reducing, and uh, certainly I think we need to come to grips with that question. Uh, that in itself, just more efficient use of energy would free up a great deal for the rest of the world. Okay, up on the first level. Uh, my name is Robert McDonald. I'm a postdoc at Harvard Forest, and um, I'd like to talk. I agree with the general point that um, it's impossible for the developed world to meet the level of consumption of, I'm sorry, for the developing world to meet the level of consumption of all of the developed world, but you also seem to imply that most of the starvation in the world somehow is related to that IPAT equation. And my sense is that much of that problem of starvation is a problem of food distribution, um, at least in the, the most bare sense of caloric intake. So I wondered if you could talk with that. Um, it, uh, it often is a problem of food distribution, but uh, you can't, in a practical sense, really distribute food all over the world. So in a sense, what that reduces to, to is more productivity in more countries and more areas around the world so the food would be accessible. Obviously, in addition to that, we're just getting used to a global system of trade, which is very, very confusing with respect to its effects on that problem. Uh, but I think local production of food and consumption would do it. There's no doubt that enough food is produced in the world to feed everybody, but it's not going to happen that way. Go to this balcony, please. Peter Prine. Uh, you mentioned very briefly the importance of incorporating corporations into all of this. How do you suggest we do that? Uh, many corporations, particularly in Europe, are already beginning to take this on board, and many organizations, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Natural Step, uh, and so forth, uh, have made good inroads there. Paul Hawken and the Levins have written nice books on the subject, natural capitalism being the most recent one. I think that uh, one of the reasons that corporations are very likely to undertake sustainable activities is very simple. If the facts that I've just reviewed and which are well known to most people in the room are anywhere nearly approximately true, corporations need to take them on board in order to be able to return value to shareholders on a consistent basis whereas governments can afford, in a way, to think of things on a much shorter term between election cycles. Uh, no doubt, over the last 20 years, the interest of corporations and the activities they've taken in this area have grown incredibly. For example, both Shell and BP 
put 15% of pre-tax profits into alternative energy and energy conservation, unlike American-based oil firms, because they want to go on being energy firms in the future and not just oil-burning firms. The U.S., as a government, on the other hand, is now spending approximately one-sixth as much on alternative energy and energy conservation in the Department of Energy as we were in 1979 in constant dollars. Uh, which one is going to come out ahead? I think the answer is pretty obvious. Over here. Hello, uh, my name is Graham Bullock, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, I also one of the co-chairs of the Environmental Professional Interest Council and one of the co-founders uh, with David Kramer of the Harvard Environment Society. And we're very glad uh, that you were able to make it here to Cambridge this time. Um, uh, I wanted to follow up on your point about uh, the most Americans list the environment as 14th as, in terms of their priorities. But at the same time, over 75% uh, classify themselves as environmentalists or at least pro-environmental protection. And some have claimed that the environmental movement has really failed at uh, sort of um, capitalizing on that interest and transforming that, that sort of you know, broad but shallow interest in something more uh, long-term and, and, uh, and deep. And I'm interested in your comments on, sort of on how the environmental movement could be more effective or if, you know, as some have claimed that we really are facing sort of the death of environmentalism and, the, and that environmental needs need to be integrated into other interests, but that environmentalism itself is something of the 20th century not the 21st. I think a lot of it revolves around the, the uh, way in which the problem is presented. I think that uh, if you understand that as a problem, Americans will list the environment as number 14, then you've got to figure out ways to talk about the environment that are inclusive. Somehow, a lot of the environmental movement, and I think we've all been guilty of this at some time, seems to want to beat the other side into submission and say you've got to stop being so stupid and understand that if you do A, B, and C, it'll be all right. All too often, and for example, in my opinion, here's a good example, when Secretary of the Interior, then Secretary of the Interior Bruce Babbitt said the Endangered Species Act would work well in the United States only if private landowners could be brought into it and some, somewhat indemnified against the negative consequences the environmental movement just beat him to death, you know, stopped him from even getting that over at all. Well, 97% of Texas is privately owned, and if you can tell me how we're going to protect endangered species in Texas without paying attention to the private sector, I'd like to give you a prize. Uh, I think somehow we've got to take a more mature and conciliatory attitude towards this and not imitate the uh, stupid antics of the two political parties which seem to think that ripping one another to pieces is the only way to reach any kind of progress. It just doesn't work. Yes. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Marks and I'm a first year MPP student here. And you suggested as a solution a bottom-up model empowering the people. Um, from my experience after working in the sustainable energy industry, I found one of the biggest barriers to change are people's attitudes and behaviors towards consumption. So how would you suggest meeting this challenge? I really think it's a matter of education. I don't believe that anybody really wants to waste anything. And I think if this is presented as waste, people get intrigued by it. People get intrigued by new uh, technologies like hybrid cars. Uh, they, they may not want to lower their standard of living, but they don't want to be gluttonous. They don't want to be visibly gluttonous about it, and I think if you can get that message across, it'll resonate well with most people. If you take the trouble to treat them in a collegial way and to explain it and deal with it, obviously, as everyone agrees, uh, children are way ahead of us in this, and dealing with children is one of the most important things provided that you deal with them intelligently and don't start bludgeoning them with major political global issues when they're six years old, which they have no hope of getting at all, but instead imbue them with a love of nature and the world and the surroundings around them, and then lead them on into an understanding of this. I think, I think Americans will want to do the right thing. People in developed countries will want to do the right thing. Okay, up on this balcony. Hi, thank you. <clears throat> My name's Tim Schmidt, and I'm an undergraduate here. And I noticed that in your uh, projection of uses of multiple planets in the future, you assume no technological or technological standards of today. 
I was wondering uh, what you think about the ability of the seemingly exponential advance in science to maybe support the optimistically stabilized population sometime this century. Well, if you read the Wall Street Journal or The Economist, you will find out that it can, but if you consult scientists and engineers, they will say that it can't. Uh, neither one is necessarily right. There's no doubt that, as I pointed out in talking about the Reverend Thomas Malthus, that technological advances make things a lot better, and yet the fantastic technological advances of the 20th century have left us with a world in which half of us are living in malnourished in absolute poverty and an eighth of us are actually starving so it's not clear that technology has kept pace with it yet yet there's no doubt at all that advances in technology and energy is a very conspicuous example can make an enormous difference the mistake would be to act as if they could just solve everything and give us license to go on forever, but I know that's not what you said. Concentrating on technology will make a, a huge difference and is extremely important in addressing these problems, and the, the uh, diagram I showed was simply a baseline to illustrate what you needed to be concerned with. This balcony? Yes, good evening. My name is Lawrence Tai. I am a junior at the college. Um, and I think the speech that you gave was really helpful because it linked two subjects together. And I get the sense that part of the problem with the way things are dealt with on a political level um, is compartmentalization, both internationally and nationally. For instance, with the biodiversity convention separate from every other convention that there is. Um, have you seen any improvement in recent years toward trying to integrate these issues together? And if not, how do you think we might get to such a point? Uh, not much. <laughs> and uh, I think it's just I think it's just a matter of education and common sense. I mean, obviously that's right, and yet we don't see much to tie things together. People are really not yet willing to regard our destiny as being a shared destiny, and to take actions that are common for our overall good, and certainly not prepared to worry about people around the world to the extent that they're willing to worry about themselves. And yet, in a more and more crowded world, one can only hope that that kind of a change in attitude will become in inevitable, and that leaders who resonate with that change in attitude will gradually uh, take over and inspire us to move still further and faster. It is inevitable. We're not dying. We're not driving ourselves to extinction. All we're doing is making the world a depressing, homogeneous place with many fewer opportunities than we have now. And at some point, that will stop because the Earth can produce only so much. And it's really up to those of us who have the advantages of a wonderful education and a good position in the world to do something about it and get there sooner rather than later. Over here. Hi. Thank you for depressing me even more than I could <laughs> My name is Marla Felcher. I teach here at the Kennedy School. I'm hoping that you can um, help settle an argument I've been having with friends for years. How do you feel about what's now called as eco-travel to places like the Galapagos and African wildlife parks? Yes or no? <laughs> what did Mae West say? Moderation is all right as long as you do it in moderation. Uh, it all depends. I mean, uh, there, there's no solid answer to it, which is why you have the running debate. Uh, people will not protect what they don't understand. People will not care at all about things that they can't see and feel and understand. Ecotourism is the single largest component in the economy of Costa Rica, and it's not at all clear that ecotourism is ruining Costa Rica. In a fragile environment like the Galapagos Islands or, say, the top of Mount Washington, the number of people there make a big difference in how the land will hold up. So I think it really is a matter of how you, how you organize it and how you apply it. But clearly, when ecotourism becomes an important value for tourists and people and enjoyment, and then will be an important value for the people of those countries and something that they can understand, it's a very powerful way of protecting uh, the sustainability of the areas that you're talking about. But it has its risks and limitations. Over here. Hi, my name is Rachel and I'm a sophomore at the college. And I was wondering if you could talk about 
the predicted water shortages in just a few decades in states like California, Texas, and Florida. Specifically, do you think desalination is a viable option for the future? Um, desalination is becoming less and less expensive as the technology is being improved, and no doubt it will be used more and more as water gets shorter and shorter. But the biggest problem with desalinizing water is you still have to get some kind of water somewhere to be able to desalinize it. And if you want to get water into the interior of Australia or something, even ignoring the buildup of salt and things in there that would make it very difficult to irrigate anything, even if you got the water there, you have a huge cost in energy and moving water, which after all is very heavy around the world. So I think if you put the two things together, the cost of desalination will become increasingly competitive in coastal places. Most people do live near the coast, and that for the people who are affluent enough to afford it will, will, will give some relief and some more water than they have now. On the other hand, lots of people in the world lack water now. There are lots of places in the world that you can't get desalinized water efficiently or cost effectively now, and it certainly is not in any way a cure-all for it. We really need to develop an attitude about water more explicitly like the attitude that I think we generally share about food, which is people really do need it and they really have a right to it. Once we've got that, then we can begin to work on how to parcel it out. A vast quantity, the great majority of water, of course, is used in agriculture, so quite clearly more efficient means of watering plants and delivering water to crops and reusing water in agricultural situations and, as usual, in almost any environmental problem, better ways of valuing water are going to help to make it work out better in the future also. But an, an awful lot of people are going thirsty now and, it's, and a lot of people are getting diseases from water. And it looks to me as if it's going to get an awful lot worse over the next few decades. And it's one of the very most important problems that we have to address. Thank you. Going up to the balcony. Yeah, Mark Chandler with the Earthwatch Institute. Um, much of the discussion about the environment focuses on biological diversity. And I was wondering how we think about and understand cultural diversity and the human dimension with respect to the environmental sustainability question and how we elevate that and integrate it. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, they're one and the same. Cultural diversity is, uh, as uh, then-President Carlos Salinas of Mexico said at the initiation of the uh, CONABIO, the Biodiversity Institute in Mexico, cultural diversity depends directly on biological diversity and in turn shapes it and makes it possible. We're losing cultural diversity all over the world at, it, it's hard to compare them, but at an extraordinarily fast rate. In terms of our need for philosophical diversity in addressing the many problems of the world, that loss is an extraordinarily serious one. And I think more and more, uh, three weeks ago, I was at a conference, some of you here may have been in France, that was called by President Chirac to address uh, biodiversity. And the whole conference was basically on linkages between biodiversity and poverty. Uh, alleviation, linkages between biodiversity and the Millennium Goals of the United Nations. And we begin to understand that better, I think we'll see people as a natural part of the world, their cultural diversity is extremely important to us, and biological diversity uh, extremely important to supporting those cultural differences also. Okay, to this balcony. Hi, um, my name's Ian Finless and I'm with the G-Day Institute at Tufts. Um, you're, in your talk, you talked a lot about uh, limits to ecosystems and then how we allocate those resources, which I would think of as the job of economics. But all our economic models assume that there aren't any limits. So um, that seems to be perhaps the fundamental problem. And how important do you think it is to change the way economics is taught? On a scale of 1 to 10, about 18. <laughs> um, uh, there are more and more, there is more and more significant grappling with that question, but I think it's of extraordinary importance in a report that uh, uh, PCAS put out when John and I were members of it at the, in this section that I chaired called Teaming with Life. We recommended very strongly that the NSF uh, do, do about a factor of 10 on funding uh, economic studies of the values of biodiversity and natural ecosystems and so forth in order to be able to understand them better. 
There are a lot of uh, obstacles uh, inherent in that, for instance, the way you think about discount rates and so forth as you go out with something like global warming, but I think it's extremely important that the better we understand those things, the better it's going to be. The real decisions that nations make are generally driven by ministries of finance, not ministries of the environment. And if we can't get the two together, and indeed they are together in reality, whether we can show that well or not, I don't think we're really going to be very successful. Hi, I'm Melissa Keeley. I'm an ecologist and uh, NSF graduate research fellow. Mm. Um, I have to admit that I resent charismatic megafauna. And uh, you said mm. that um, people don't appreciate the things that they don't know and understand. And I'm concerned that um, our mm. focus, the environmental movement's focus on these icons, um, leads people to not really understand their local environment and thus kind of have a disconnect between their actions, day-to-day -day actions and the environment. And I was wondering if you have ideas on what we can do to kind of square the circle on uh, both, on these, uh, not losing sight of these bigger issues, but focusing on local as well. Well, a couple of observations. I, I think that for children, as I already said, the biggest thing to get people really interested in this whole suite of problems is to get them interested probably before the age of 10 in their local environment because that's the, the thing that will stay with them in general and drive them to think about and take these problems seriously indefinitely. Uh, the second thing is, uh, as you may know, for example, we can do a lot of things to show these things off locally uh, for example, at the Natural History Museum in London, in South Kensington, the bottom floor of the natural of the new newest section that'll be built, Darwin II, will entirely be devoted to biodiversity in and around London. And uh, they're going to try then to educate the some three million people that are on a transect between the museum and Darwin's house and uh, Down House in Kent. Uh, and use that as a way of bringing home the biodiversity of the area, which people are very, very hungry to know about. As to uh, defaming those venerable icons, I'm for anything I can get. <laughs> if they work, fine. Over here. I'm Sachi Dajha from uh, Indian Forest Service and UMass Boston. Uh, one of the hopes for saving biodiversity is in the option value, particularly in medicinal areas. Could you please something tell about the North-South cooperation in that field? Thank you. Well, a medicinal area uh, uh, is one, of course, where um, India has a very, well, has a couple of very rich traditions and uh, uh, the foundation for local health revitalization and the People's Biodiversity Centers and various other movements in India have worked with local peoples to try to help them grow and preserve and understand their local uh, medicinal plants better so they can be harvested sustainability, sustainably. Uh, one of the big problems about the supply of medicinal plants now in developing countries like India and China being the two biggest ones that really depend on them is of course the insatiable hunger for those same plants as dietary supplements and medicinal supplements in Japan, Europe, and the United States, which is causing huge quantities to be harvested with very little payback to local people and then uh, not available to them anymore. But I think India is a particularly good example of that. We, of an effort to counteract that. There are several organizations working very well, including of course, Atri in Bangalore. But, I, but um, other people around the world are addressing the same kind of problem as those herbs get to be more global commodities, and I, we have to redouble our efforts to do that in the future. Okay, up on the balcony. Hi, yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you, Professor Raven. Uh, my name is Anne. I just have a question. Well, this it's is working. really <laughs> No, I just have a question in regards to, I don't know if you've touched on this topic, your ground breaking paper with Paul Ehrlich. Um, is this, did I get this right on the, on the idea of co-evolution? What does that mean? Oh, oops. <laughs> did uh, I get, what is that? Oops, okay, you're gonna tell us. Okay. Anything you want it to mean, no. Uh, co-evolution, uh, as we, well, Paul and I did a study of butterflies and their larval food plants, what the caterpillars would eat, and we tried to see which groups we're eating which groups, 
And as we did that, we found that some plants were eaten by no butterflies, others were eaten by many, and others were specialized. And by a series of deductions that I won't take time to lay out now, we, we deduced that that would have originated by a stepwise, uh, by a series of evolutionary steps wherein the plants might develop a chemical defense the butterflies and other herbivores might relatively avoid them in the beginning, and eventually for those that could learn to overcome those chemical defenses in one way or another, uh, they could specialize on those plants, and in some cases the chemicals that would be poisonous to most of them would be attractants to the ones that specialized on them. And then of course, eventually so many would be feeding on those that that defense is no good. So a stepwise evolutionary uh, sequence. And it was really, uh, uh, I think, more that we popularized the name, which is a convenient name for thinking about quite a few biological phenomena. We, we sort of made up that name in our title. It had been used once or twice previously, but not very seriously. But by popularizing it and uh, calling it out in the title of an article in Evolution and then one in Scientific American, there have been thousands and thousands of papers written on the on various ways of, it, of doing that kind of a stepwise race ever since. Oh, I'm sorry, just one more thing, Professor Raven. What year was that? You said? Nin 1965, I think, evolution. No, the co-evolution, yeah, that you, 19, the buzzword In the journal you evolution, and then about 1966 in Scientific American. All right, thank you. And that, that was the work for which uh, Peter Raven and Paul Ehrlich shared the Crawford Prize, the, the equivalent of the Nobel for biology. Uh, now we're up there, yes. Humphrey Wong, mid-career, Master in Public Administration, Kennedy School. Um, I'm in uh, Professor Clark's sustainable development class, where we're, we're, we're just uh, grappled with uh, interpreting Kai Lee's book, uh, Compass and Gyroscope, um, where he described the process, of, sorry, the process of adaptive management or civic science in trying to balance the needs of biodiversity and um, human needs. Can you give me some idea, maybe it's the answer is at the end of the course, uh, but can you give me some <laughs> idea now? Um, is it, is it? <laughs> of, uh, of how well some version of that has been applied to the world. Uh, everything we do is a form of adaptive management because we keep, we keep changing landscapes and then trying to catch up. So. That's the way we do deal with them as our populations have grown from a few million people to 6.3 billion. In some cases, we've completely exhausted and used them up as in loss of 20% of agricultural land or 20% of the topsoil along the way. What we wanna do is to take actions, to consider our actions, to take actions, to study the effects of those actions and to find better ways to proceed into the future. I think the book you just study is a masterpiece and I, uh, think uh, you'll like it better and better as the course goes along. Over here, please. Hi, uh, Peter Alden, uh, involved in showing people charismatic megafauna all over the world, 100 countries, <clears throat> and involved in biodiversity at the millimeter level uh, for the state and for Ed Wilson, your mutual friend. Uh, the question is, it seems like a whole lot of money that was flowing to America back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s is suddenly mm -hmm. swinging around and headed over to Europe, which has a pretty good conservation environmental record. Uh, better than our current administration. Mm -hmm. A lot of the money's going to China, uh, which, you know, we all sort of know what's going on there. A lot of but what the money? Uh, just sort of the, the world surplus money seems to be flowing over. Well, a lot of it's going to Europe, a lot of it's going to China, and a lot of it's going for oil to the Mideast. The people in the Mideast, many of the students, from what we read, and I'm not an expert, uh, are reading one book, the Koran. Does the Koran have anything positive on the environment and the future of life on the planet, or anything in the Mideast that is positive that you've seen developing? Because a lot of money's flowing that way, and therefore a lot of power. Uh, I can't quote it to you, but I can tell you that scholars of Islam find many things in the Koran and in the traditional teachings in Islam that do have to do with preserving the environment and keeping human life going. And if you look at any compendium of you know, what the world's major religions uh, say about the environment, you'll find those positive examples. But I cannot quote them to you now. But they are there. OK, over here. Just uh, one more question. Uh, Mark Chandler from Earthwatch Institute. It's not clear that business as usual from the environmental movement will be able to address the problems 
in, in an urgent enough fashion. And I was wondering, what big opportunity do you see that you would encourage people to really focus on? What's the, the number one on your list of, of things that could be done that isn't done as, as uh, urgently as? as um, well, I think it's important to repeat what I said before, and that is that we're not turning a light switch on or off or reaching extinction or not reaching it. What we're really engaged in, in my opinion, is a very prolonged process of deteriorating the Earth's environment and making it less interesting. So there's no point, in my opinion, at which you can say it's either good or bad or on or off. Uh, and in that sense, uh, I can't say that next year is the last time we'll have a chance to do something. Uh, I think the biggest, I think the two biggest, uh, probably to me, the two biggest opportunities or the two biggest things are that we ought to attend to in the United States are energy, where our attitude is clearly impossible, you know, unsustainable, impossible, hugely destructive. Uh, Stefan Schmidheine, the Swiss industrialist, wrote in an op-ed piece in the New York Times about 12 years ago, there is no greater favor that America could pay to European and Japanese industry than to pretend that global warming does not exist because by doing so, you're putting yourself in the same position you did in 1970 when you pretend that Americans had no interest in efficient, smaller Japanese cars. Uh, that's got to out at some point. That's got to make a, a, a difference at some point, and I do believe it will. I believe it's practical, and I believe it's inevitable. We can't go on assuming that because we have tens of thousands of people employed in the coal industry at the present time, that we ought to go on building more and more and more coal-fired plants to keep them employed any more than we can go on assuming that we need to support a, a, a gr grotesquely large world fishing fleet to hound the last fish in the world down to extinction in order to pretend that there's some return. And I think eventually the logic of that comes out, and so I think it's a good pressure point. I think one of the most important thing that we as Americans can do is to promote internationalism and an understanding of people around the world and do that vigorously and in every forum that we have and remind ourselves and our children that there's a lot more to the world out there than, than uh, simply England and France, you know, charming and interesting as they are. And get to know other people because just like charismatic megafauna, you're unlikely to really care about them unless you know them. And finally, I think if you care about these issues, you must. You have an obligation, living in a privileged democracy, to get out there, and that would be about where Kai Lee ends up his book, to get out there and vote and take action and call attention to leaders of society to the problems that you think are important. And if you do, you'll get what you work for, and if you don't, you'll get what you deserve. That, uh, that, that would be a suitable finale, but our custom is to take one last question at 7 o'clock. It is 7 o'clock, and with apologies to others who may be waiting in the rotation, the balcony is next. So you get the last question, and Peter can be thinking up an even more inspiring answer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kate. I'm a PhD student at the Kennedy School, so I'm going to ask you a very uh, tough and intellectual question. What's your favorite plant? My favorite plant. People ask me that a lot, and I don't know. <laughs> I've, uh, I've uh, loved uh, so many plants at different times. And when I was a kid and a teenager, you know, it was one after the other that I found absolutely thrilling. I can still remember all those times, and uh, I can't do it. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. That was great, and thank you all very much.